Welcome to Electra Online. Now let's take a look at the flight path that Mercury 10 took in order to reach Mercury and was able to fly past it three times before the fuel ran out. So how did it do that? It left Earth November 3rd, 1973, started heading towards Venus, and by the time it reached Venus, it had picked up quite a bit of speed. It had reached a speed of 37 kilometers per second, which is over 80,000 miles per hour. It used the gravitational attraction between the spacecraft and Venus in order to slow it down. That's called a gravitational assist. Typically, when we travel to the outer solar system, we use the gravitational assist to pick up speed. But in this case, it was necessary to slow the spacecraft down. Now, it doesn't appear like there was a big slowdown. It went from 37 kilometers per second as it approached Venus to 32.3 kilometers per second as it left Venus. But remember, the kinetic energy of a spacecraft depends on the velocity squared. So any significant change in the velocity has a huge impact on the change in the kinetic energy. If you didn't do it through a gravitational assist, it would have to be done by burning fuel, lots and lots of fuel to slow the spacecraft down, and that would have been too much fuel to carry, and the mission could not have been carried out the way it was done. And so by using the gravitational assist, we saved quite a bit of fuel. The thinking was that it would require about three times as much fuel as they actually did carry in order to make that then happen, and that would have been way too much fuel. So the first time they came by uh, Mercury, that was on March 29, 1974. They flew by on the dark side of the planet, away from the sun. They did so for a special reason, because they used the, inf the, the UV radiation detector to study the interaction between the solar wind and the planet, and they wanted to study the atmosphere, and they wanted to look at the, the uh, emissions of the atmospheric particles in the UV light. And of course, if you're exposed to the sun, the UV radiation from the sun would definitely interfere with your ability to measure the, the UV radiation from the dark side uh, accurately. So that's why they flew past the dark side. They actually got quite close to the surface, to about 700 kilometers from the surface, to take accurate measurements. Now notice, where did the, the spacecraft go afterwards? As they flew past the planet, they went into a very elliptical orbit in such a way that the time that it took to make one complete orbit around the sun and get back to where the planet Mercury is. And notice where the planet Mercury is. The planet Mercury, every time the spacecraft went by it, is at aphelion, meaning the furthest point in its orbit away from the sun. They did that to protect the, sp the, sp the spacecraft as much as possible from the harsh radiation of the sun. If you had passed by Mercury, let's say, at perihelion when you're really close to the sun, the spacecraft would have been exposed to much more radiation and would have been much more difficult to protect the instrumentation on the spacecraft. So they did it correctly by passing by Mercury when it was far away from the sun. But notice the path that the spacecraft took before it re, re rendezvoused with the planet was such that the time it took to go around the sun for the spacecraft was exactly twice as much time as it takes Mercury to go around the sun once. So that way, as the spacecraft went around the sun once, Mercury would go around the sun twice and they would meet up again right there at aphelion. So since the time it takes for Mercury to go around the sun is 88 days, it was then therefore necessary to have a flight path for Voyager 10, uh, not Voyager 10, but Mariner 10, that would last exactly twice 88 days or 176 days. Now notice, it flew past the planet on March 29th and again on September 21st. How many days are there between those two dates? Well, we can add it up over here. In March, there were two days left between March 29th and March 31st. In April, there are 30 days, 31 for May, 30 for June, 31 for July, 31 for August, 21 for September. Notice, add them all up, exactly 176 days, twice the time that it takes for Mercury to go around the sun once. So then it went by Mercury a second time. Now on the second time it flew on the sunny side of Mercury, quite far away from the surface, about 40,000 kilometers. I've of course exaggerated the size of that distance, but the reason why they did is because they wanted to take pictures in the visible light, and they were able to take about pictures of about 46% of the surface of the planet. Then again, they went around. It took again exactly two Mercury years. Here we can check. Nine days in September, 31 in October, 30 November, 
31 in December, 31 in January, 28 in February, 16 in March, because the third time it reached the planet on March the 16th. Add up all the days, again, exactly twice 88 days, two Mercury years, and again, the spacecraft rendezvous. If the spacecraft had enough fuel, they could potentially keep doing that dozens and dozens of times, but because each one of those orbits takes course corrections, and for course corrections, you need fuel, and you can only carry so much fuel, eventually it ran out. So after it passed the third time, on the third time they flew by very close to the surface on the sunny side. They did so so they could study the magnetic field. They wanted to be as close as possible, possible to the surface because the magnetic field strength diminishes as you go farther away from the planet. And they were able to confirm that, yes indeed, Mercury does have a magnetic field. Actually, a significant amount of magnetic field for the small planet because they were expecting to find virtually no magnetic field, if maybe none at all, which indicated, first of all, that yes, Mercury must have a metal core. The measurements on the density and the mass of the planet indicated that it had probably a very large uh, metal core, and because of the magnetic field strength, it was therefore indicated that part of that core had to be molten for the dynamo effect. So they were able to measure the magnetic field when it came by a third time, but after that they ran out of fuel, so not very many days after the third uh, flyby, they decommissioned the spacecraft and they stopped communicating with the spacecraft and just let it go in free flight. Since it was no longer controlled, we don't know what really happened to the spacecraft. It's very possible that it's continuing to go into orbit around the sun, passing around the sun once for every two orbits of Mercury, but of course, you can imagine it's been out there now for about 40 years or so, or 45 years. It had a lot of radiation damage by now. It probably will be close to being completely destroyed. All the functionality will be gone. It's just a hunk of metal out there with some dead equipment that's just circling around the sun, perhaps for many, many more years to come. And who knows, one day it might even collide with Mercury. And that is how it goes for the old Mariner 10. But while it was doing its thing, Man, we got some great information out of it, and we learned a lot about the planet Mercury by this ingenious way in which they flew by the planet.